please sit tight and we will get started in just a few moments. Thank you so much. Morning everyone, it takes uh, Zoom just about a minute to add everybody into the room, so as you're getting added, please sit tight and we'll get started in few, just a few moments, thank you. Okay, hopefully Zoom has had time to add everybody, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the 2020 election. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications and I'll be moderating this event. Both Republicans and Democrats are claiming their opponents will try to rig the upcoming election and there's also the threat of foreign interference. We have two Duke scholars with us today to help us sort through the various threats to a legitimate US election and where we should be focusing our attention. I'll introduce our speakers and get the discussion started, then we'll open it up to questions. Thanks to those reporters who already sent questions. During this discussion, those of you joining us on Zoom can submit questions via the Q&A window at any time for me to ask. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions in person in a few minutes. Thanks also to everyone watching this on YouTube. With us today is Judith Kelly. She is Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke, where she is also a senior fellow with the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Her areas of research include human rights, democracy, and international election observation. Good morning to you. Good morning. Also joining us is Sue Gordon. She is a former US Principal D Deputy Director of National Intelligence. She's currently teaching courses at Duke on political science and political policy, including national security and leadership in the public sphere. Good morning to you. Good morning, Greg. And uh, Sue Gordon, I'd like to start with you. Um, sure. The US intelligence community has warned members of Congress about active foreign interference in this year's election. Based on your experience, how serious is that threat and how concerned should Americans be about the possible effects? So it's a, it's a real threat. I think starting in 2016, when we saw uh, Russian actions targeted on our election, um, the intelligence community has considered it significant enough that they have talked about it openly. Um, recognizing that you needed to get the information in the hands of the people, citizens, and state and local governments because they're the ones that control the election system. So first things first, that this is being talked about openly by the intelligence com community means that it's serious. Um, I, we have adversaries who have long intended to, in the case of Russia, undermine democracy, in the case of China, to be able to use our system to increase their particularly economic power, and even Iran and North Korea who want to achieve, achieve their regional gains by influencing what happens here. And now we have a world that is digitally connected that allows both access to the possibility of interfering in the electoral, electoral system and creating havoc on the influence, influence side by using the magnification of social media. So it's real. Um, should citizens be concerned, they should know that there are malign actors who are trying to shape what we do. But I will also say that especially since 2016, there have been great effort put into securing the election system themselves, the voting system. So should US citizens feel comfortable that, that we have with the private sector done a lot of things to protect the actual election voting system. And so people should be comfortable, as comfortable as you can, that, that that work has been done to try and ensure the integrity and we don't see efforts going on to now wreck the integrity of that system. But that, that they should be mindful that some of the messages they hear, some of the things that they see are potentially being manipulated by actors outside the United States. So be a critical consumer um, and be aware of the possibility but do I believe that we've done a good job to protect, protect the election system? Yes. Okay, thank you. Lots to dig into there and we will come back mm -hmm. to that. Uh, but for now, Dean Kelly, I'd like to move on to you. Um, 
Because of the pandemic, you know, we're likely to see an unprecedented volume of mail imbalance. And the president has claimed that will create the potential for mass voting fraud. Do, do those claims have any merit, do you think? Thank you, Greg. Uh, three points. First, this election is not going to be, quote unquote, won through massive mail-in ballot fraud. Okay, that is not how this election will be won. Uh, the unprecedented volume, my second point, is actually not that unprecedented. In the last election, 25% of the electorate cast their ballot by mail, with 30 million ballots cast by mail. So it's not like we haven't had the volume before that would enable massive fraud. And yet we do not have a history of such massive fraud. Furthermore, when there have been attempts at what's called ballot harvesting, they have been one, small, and two, discovered. Case in point being the ninth district here in North Carolina, the system worked, uh, the uh, cheaters, uh, in this case were uh, on the Republican side, were caught and the election was rerun. Um, third point is that it is true that mail-in ballots are rejected at a much higher rate than in-person ballots. However, mail-in ballots are rejected roughly only at 1% rate. And when they are rejected, they are not rejected because of fraud. They are rejected because voters make mistakes with pen and paper. And sometimes there is not uh, adequate time to correct those or notify the voter that this ballot is not able to be processed the way you indeed may be notified if you are attempting to put it through a machine. When you cast your ballot in person, it may spit it back out and say, you voted for two people on this, go back, fix it. You know, we can't do that. Uh, so the biggest takeaway point for the American voter is no different from the point that the post office actually wisely made, which is that the American people, if they intend to cast their ballot by mail, should do so as early as possible. And when they do so, this ballot can be tracked just like a UPS or other kind of package there is a barcode or another form of code, you will be able to see how it's moving through the system and when it has been received. And it is a safe way to cast your ballot. Just pay attention to how you fill it out. Gotcha, thank you very much. Thank you both for those uh, opening answers. Um, we will now open it up to questions. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can type a question into the Q&A window or you can raise your hand in Zoom so we can unmute you. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, and that way you can ask your question in person. Um, so, uh, Sue Gordon, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, you talked about the different um, malign actors internationally and what their interests are. Could you talk a little bit more about what their varying abilities are to interfere with the election and their interests? Since that seems to be a matter of some confusion and dispute. Um, yeah, so the, the thing to know is, um, hmm, in a world of cyber, Everyone thinks that cyber is something unique and different. It is just the way that today that everyone affects their interests. So let's talk about the interests of the various nations. So Russia and long before in the Soviet Union had doctrine, had intention to undermine democracy in the Cold War it was called active measures, um, propaganda activities to get us to um, uh, perceive ourselves a different way or not believe in ourselves. So the Russian interest is undermining democracy. And so their involvement in the elections and their considerable abilities as an intelligence service makes them particularly worrisome because we saw them in 2016 directly, because we know they have broad capability and because it is so tied to their doctrine that that's, that's why we talk about Russia so much. Um, China has a growing um, uh, participation in terms of trying to shape elections or interfere. They certainly use digital media. They certainly, COVID was a great example where we saw them trying to shape, undermine or steal information. 
Um, but China's interests are much more about their economic advance, their power. And so when they conduct actions against the United States, it's, that's why we see so much intellectual property theft um, and so much work on the tech side in terms of what the policies are in terms of trade. It's really to seek their own power advantage. And then you have actors like Iran that are not really global actors in a sense, but they now have global reach technically. And so their interests will be to try and shape issues related to them, get us out of the Middle East, undermine the alliances that we have with the West around JCPOA or other things. So what you see is varying interests being affected through the same mode, but it's important to understand what's trying to be achieved because that's one of the really important elements of protecting yourself against it. So the elections are the vehicle, but the aim is something very different by actor. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Dean Kelly, you work a lot, you've studied a lot the area of uh, international election observation. Um, and I think some Americans might think of international election observers as something generally we see in developing countries with fragile democracies. But of course, international monitors have been observing US elections since 2002. Could you tell us how that process works and what difference observers can make if they do find evidence that an election isn't as fair and free as the law requires? Yes. I will, if, if I may just backtrack and make one more point about mail-in ballots and then I'll get to your point, Greg. Um, another point I had wished to make about mail-in ballots is that uh, I think we're seeing a situation right now where we're being set up to believe that if mail-in ballots are taking time to count, that means there's a problem with them. Um, how long it takes to count mail-in ballots is not a function of their quality. It is a function of when the um, uh, officials are allowed to start to count. Uh, so I just want to make that very clear. Um, as, as far as international election monitoring, uh, it's, it's worth putting in perspective that the United States has been a beacon of democracy around the world, and one of its primary tools has been international election monitoring. The United States, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute, and the Carter Center have some, been some of the foremost organizations, two of those funded you know, by Congress to promote uh, election monitoring and democracy around the world. In the, in the United States, the United States uh, being part of the OSCE, uh, signed the Copenhagen Declaration of 1990 that obligates it to receive OSCE observers. And after the uh, 2000 Florida election, OSCE observers began to come to the United States. Uh, it works in three ways. Uh, first, there's a pre-electoral mission that's already uh, been here from the OSCE. Uh, I believe they actually might be holding a press conference today. So uh, whoever's on the call should try to tune into that. Uh, they issued a report uh, they normally issue a report after their pre-electoral uh, assessment mission in which they sort of assess uh, the context for holding the election and whether or not the, uh, the, uh, the logistical and the legislative context is sound. And they make a series of recommendations and they did so for the United States as well this summer. Uh, in addition, they then send a team of long-term observers who arrive three to four weeks before the election, sometimes two weeks before the election, depending on when uh, things fall into place. And they may stay uh, up to a week after the election uh, or longer if there's uh, something that's very contested. And then there is a huge team uh, of short-term observers that come and do the bulk of the work in actually observing the conduct of the, of the polling. And, and they'll just arrive a couple, you know, a couple of days before and, and leave the, the, the day after. Um, historically, they work in two ways. One, election observers can have a deterrent effect that if you think you're going to be watched and caught, maybe less likely to cheat. And you know, some of my work has shown that statistically uh, that that has been true for. Um, for emerging democracies. Doesn't work for autocracies. They're, they're dictators are just not really gonna care either way. Um, so there's a deterrent effect. Uh, more importantly though, is the, the relationship that gets developed and the recommendations that get made 
where we really have been, in the United States has been in a position of playing the role of, of teacher, saying, here are the things you can do different, here are the things you can do better, uh, if you really want to have credible elections. And it's really uh, quite confusing for me, as somebody who studied election monitoring uh, for so long, to see the exact same things that the United States has, press, has expressed concern about in election monitoring missions funded by the United States, to see those exact same concerns being raised in this election vis-a-vis -vis the United States conduct of its own election. Thank you, yes, and that actually brings me to uh, another major point that I wanted to, to make here is that you know, popular elections are obviously at the heart of American democracy, uh, but the president has been making comments um, that seem designed to undermine confidence in the election. Mm. Um, I mean, is that a form of election interference in itself? And, and how dangerous is it? So I'll jump first and you go, then you fix it. I, I think from a long time uh, intelligence officer, under, understanding a bit about uh, our adversaries and competitors, and the interests I just mentioned, there's a piece of me that is listening to our national discussion that is centers around telling our citizens that either you can't trust your institutions or you can't trust the voting process or you can't trust the other guys. If I am sitting in our adversary shoes who are trying to shape, and particularly in the case of the, the Russians, what I worry about is they're sitting back going, yes, we can, we have achieved our aim. That beacon that Judith talks about, that the world has relied on, actually looks like we're telling people that our system is not trustworthy. And listen, I'm a career bureaucrat. I have lots of opinions about how bureaucracy needs to fit, be fixed. So this isn't about that things don't go wrong and need to be fixed. Judith's point about we detect things and then we repair them. I'm just thinking this notion of this national conversation that is centered around lack of trustworthiness or that you can't believe it or there's massive cheating, that that in itself is an undermining act, particularly in the light of, of adversaries and competitors who are hoping that we become weaker so they can become stronger. So I, I absolutely agree with Sue. Um, this is, um, I, 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 I think we have to be very careful not to use fear in this election in general. I, I, I don't think fear is a constructive tactic. But it, I do think that if there's one thing we all ought to be very concerned about, it's the state of our democracy itself. And, and this type of uh, undermining in the confidence of our institutions is undermining in the confidence of our democracy. Um, it's, it's interesting having watched election observers and dictators over the years, how bizarre the strategy actually is. Because normally if you have somebody who can't win an election and they are a strong incumbent, what they will do is they will uh, plan to cheat, but then they will tell everybody that the election is going to be great. It's going to be perfect. We have everything under control. It's, it's going to be smooth. It's going to be free and fair. And then I'm going to cheat and then I'm going to win. And the election was credible. That's how you maintain you know, a, a, a mandate because you don't maintain a mandate through an election that wasn't free and fair. So you want to try to say, it's going to be free, it's going to be fair. In this situation, we have the opposite happening um, and, and uh, where, the, um, uh, where the, uh, the president is trying to undermine the confidence in the election, which is, is quite ironic when you think about the fact that we are also at the same time saying that we are the best country in the world, that we are the greatest so shouldn't we have the greatest election system too? You know, uh, but apparently, you know, we don't. And I think it comes down to the fact that uh, that this president is not actually trying to win this election. This president is trying to not have to concede this election. That. Wow. 
that is what's going on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, we're getting a little bit of feedback from somewhere, not sure what's happening there, but we've had uh, some questions from reporters um, and Dean Kelly, I'd like for you to take this one first. It's specifically about situation here in North Carolina. Um, as you may be aware, the, uh, uh, we've learned that the national Republican groups have instructed Republicans here at county boards of elections in North Carolina to not comply with new absentee ballot rules sent out by the state of elections because they claim that the, the, because the rules haven't been approved by the courts. Is this something, uh, is this common to see in the US that a national group would, uh, would send instructions to party members on county boards? Uh, and do you think that it poses any risk to the processing of absentee ballots or public confidence in the, in the count? It is absolutely not common. I, I don't recall a similar situation. Um, again, it plays right into just on the local level, what Sue was talking about in the beginning. It's just, it's an effort to sow confusion and, and, and to undermine the confidence in the process. Um, we should all be able to unite around the process. And, and this is not, this is not helpful. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, there, I have a few other questions regarding uh, process. So, uh, Dean Kelly, you've said before that it's hard to rig an election in the US because the system's so decentralized. Um, but given that we know there are certain places in the country that are likely to be crucial to the overall result of the presidential election, whether it's Florida or Ohio or so on, is there a risk that people could try and place their thumbs on the scale in certain places? And like, how would that work? Absolutely. And I think they will in the sense of, you know, it, it, there, there will be small efforts at trying to, to cheat. And because you can't massively cheat, you will have to be very strategic about putting your thumb on the scale in the right places. My point is not that you can't do that. My point is that you won't win that way ultimately, because I have confidence that, we, that we, we detect these things. Why did we detect the mail harvesting in North Carolina in the last election? Well, because, you know, for the same reason that the media doesn't call an election uh, right away, you know, they have expectations about how a certain district is going to come out. They, uh, so if they don't see those expectations playing out, they're going to wait to have a certain percentage counted until they're confident that this is really true. And so we will, it, when you have instances where, 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 foul play is at hand, it will ultimately show up in that something's off here. Now that may be because of fraud or it may be because voters actually cast their ballot that way, but when there's a flag that goes up, it will be investigated, right? And then we have data on, okay, so who was sent mail ballots? Well, if you know all the mail ballots were sent to Democrats to be extreme, then it would be very odd if they came back um, you know, all cast for Republicans or vice versa, right? So there are flags that we will catch and then we'll, we will take time to investigate them. And unfortunately, you know, both sides are very lawyered up and that is what is going to, we will have contestation after this election. And which is why we, we should not be surprised um, that, you know, unless we have a landslide, we won't know the result right after the election. And that's actually a good thing because it means the system is working. Right. If you've got somebody who's really cheating, then they just declare victory uh, right away and there's no further investigation. Um, and if you stop the system and say, no, there are places we need to inquire and, and sort it out and make sure we've got it right. We want to have a result in which we have confidence, in which the voters have confidence and we have all the mechanisms to do that. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, there's one thing you mentioned about how, you know, we should expect a delay in the result and that means the process is working. But given the unprecedented uh, level of attention that there's going to be and the pressure to get a result, are you concerned that any kind of delay, you know, is going to result in people, whether it's taking legal action or bringing pressure to bear to get a result before we actually have fully counted ballots? I think we're all concerned right now about how the period after the election is going to play out. This is happening in the context in which we already have uh, protests in our streets because of Black Lives Matter, um, civil unrest in places. And now we have a situation in which you throw in the Supreme Court instability, uh, the president potentially appointing somebody to the court that may decide the outcome. 
of um, a particular suit that's brought up. Uh, and this is a highly volatile situation. And I, I am very concerned about uh, somebody claiming premature victory uh, about uh, the process not being allowed to play out and about how the American people and even more how American politicians will conduct themselves in the weeks after the election. Can I sure, jump in you. for a second? Can Please I jump don't. in for a second, Greg? So uh, kind of three points. One, to pick up on Edith's point about uh, the system. So I mentioned early in my comment, the work done since 2016 between the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI and the National Security Agency and the intelligence community writ large to not just talk about interference, but to work with state and local governments to make sure that at every level, because one of the, as you just said, one of the great things about our country is that we're open, disparate, we have not completely locked down um, one system. We actually have a lovely framework and that allows some protection, but we have had to work through that in order to give every state, every locality, the best wisdom, access to the best capabilities, get monitoring those places. And that has been done. And so we are well positioned there. But even more than that, the private sector has really leapt into the fray. Um, both in terms of offering expertise to protect the systems themselves, but also doing much more work on authentication of accounts and data that are going through, say, the social media. So there's a lot of work that has been undertaken to put our systems in, in my estimation, the best they have been in the last few years to try and organize it. If I were going to now this is citizen Sue Gordon. Um, talk to, to my fellow citizens. I would say two things: one, vote, and feel confidence and confident in voting. And then two, this year particularly, be patient, because it is likely going to be take more time for us to be certain of the re results. And remember, we don't actually know the result on election night anytime. It has to have votes come in and certified. That just usually goes on in the background, and we're confident. So voters will be a little bit patient. I, I agree with Dean Kelly that I think um, the system will work and we will get to a solution that can trust, but there's gonna to have to be some patient involved. It's gonna be so important. You know, I, I, I know it sounds strange, but to say, hey, we should not make this election process into a political issue, but it's going to be so important to understand that there are, uh, there are voters out there, there are Republicans, and there are Democrats. They all have a right to cast their ballot and, and they wanna do so with confidence. And we should let that process play out and let the people speak um, and, and hold on to our institutions of democracy foremost, uh, yes. rather than the short-term interest of, of any party. Yes. Sure, thank you both there. And um, Sue Gordon, I'd like to come back to you on this notion of patience, because certainly patience is required, but certainly it also seems like patience can be in short supply a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, what are you certainly. concerned about from a kind of intelligence and national security perspective, if there is a significant delay to the result of the election and it causes a lot of tension you know, across the country, does that kind of further the goals that you mentioned about the foreign actors might have in terms of destabilizing the country? What do you see as some of the potential effects if there is a substantial delay? Yeah, I'm, I'm on the record and, and I've told the president as well that, that I think the greatest threat to America right now is that we won't believe in ourselves. I mean, there, yeah, there are worries that you could have a cyber attack on the Eastern Seaboard power grid and that's worrisome um, and, and armed conflict is always worrisome, but America has withstood those things. Um, we, are, we are not yet to our 300th birthday um, and this democracy thing is hard. And one of the things that it is predicated on is believing that you have the right idea of freedoms and justice and transparency. Um, and all those things are important. And what worries me if this continues to go on, what was started in one direction has now bloomed into others is if people believe that they can't trust 
um, the CDC or the FBI or name your organization, if they believe that their neighbor is actually personally against them rather than my experience, that almost every American is good, optimistic, helps their neighbor, tolerant of those things. If we start believing that we are fundamentally not good as opposed to fundamentally bad, that will erode our confidence and it will lessen our ability to be that projector of how it can be, particularly at a time where the world is changing so much. So many of our institutions are trying to catch up to a world that is turning so fast. In times of chaos, um, totalitarianism looks attractive to people who can't tolerate uncertainty. So I think, I think there really is this moment where kind of the whole world is in the mix. Which system is going to win at a time that the world is changing? And we have to ensure that our fundamental premises that are born on the backs of our people believing that they're right can continue. Because I think the worldwide effects of, of what's happening here will be far greater in terms of alliances, in terms of ability of our partners in emergent nations to withstand pressure from other countries, just so much is at stake here. And I don't know whether Judith agrees with me, but no, that's how I, I see it. I absolutely agree with you, yeah. I would just also say that to keep our democracy alive, it is so important that we don't malign uh, each other. You know, the polarization we've seen play, is playing right into this. And if we start to get into this mindset that, that whatever party we don't belong to, that the other party is evil, um, then we are also undermining democracy because democracy relies on a robust debate between different viewpoints. And we should be discussing policy issues, not identity issues. We should be discussing whether trade policy X, Y, Z or environmental policy X, Y, Z, what are the actual costs and what are the actual benefits and who pays and how are those distributed and should we or should we not do it? Not I am a Republican or I am a Democrat and therefore I simply you know, take the stand. We need discourse and we need, uh, we need therefore to be able to respect one another and, and, not, and not just say uh, these actors are bad. It's so important for our democracy. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, Sue Gordon, uh, it seems like we have nothing but $64,000 questions today, but here is okay. one for you. Given your decades of experience in intelligence and national security, you know, the president has um, said outright that he might not accept the election result. Um, what, what do you, how would you see that unfolding? If, if, if there were a clear defeat, if the election is certified and the president has lost, but refuses to accept, what actually happens then? Uh... Um, one, I'm not sure that I'm the best position um, to, to talk about the big effect. My immediate response would be, um, I don't like the statement. I think it, again, sows uncertainty, but I would probably also say there's a big difference between a tweet and policy. So um, I, I would be, or even a statement and policy. So what I would say is not overreacting to that not imagining that we're going to have to mobilize our own military to do this, but rather say that it's a statement of his intention to continue to be the president, not necessarily an intention to override all the government things here. So just be a little careful with some of those single statements, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't carry them too far. I believe in the system. I would, I do. I would, yeah, I, I would add too. You know, there are neither Sue or I are constitutional lawyers, and, but even if you ask constitu constitutional lawyers, there are a, a bunch of different scenarios that can play out, all of which reveal that we actually have this far less under control than we think we do. Like we did not play all these scenarios out when we, um, when we wrote the rules. Um, and that it's even conceivable that two different people will show up to be um, sworn in to office. Uh, and you know we were apparently close to that. Uh, uh, at, at some uh, in some election with Hayes, etc. So, uh, what the my, I think the more important answer is: what will it depend on whether or not we have a mess? 
And what it will depend on is how the Republican and the Democratic parties each choose to react. How does the leadership choose to react? After the election, um, the leadership of each party will have a choice either to stand up and say, we are democracy and we believe in the election result and we're going to back it up because it stops now. The game is over. The election has played out. Or they can say, well, maybe we can get away with it and we can push and we can make a mess and maybe we can stay in power for another four years. Or maybe we can capture power for the next four years. That's just a, that would be such a short-sighted gain and such a long-term loss for our country. So, so much will depend on what is Nancy Pelosi, what is Mitch McConnell, what are each, what is Trump, what is Biden going to say after uh, election day? And particularly, what would the party leaders say? Because without their support, honestly, neither uh, presidential candidate will be able to play uh, whatever game they may have in mind playing. Yeah, I believe the election results will be believable. I do. I, I, think, I think our system is sound. I think the work we've put in, they will be believable results. The question is, will the parties allow them to be believed? That's right. Yes, it's certainly going to be interesting to watch that unfold. Uh, we have a reporter question for you, Sue Gordon, um, which says that obviously, as you mentioned earlier, the 2016 election cycle kind of shed some light on foreign election yeah. interference. But um, is it a new concern is that in the US? Is there any evidence that previous elections may have been impacted by foreign interference? Or is it basically a, a product of the cyber era? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it is a relatively new phenomenon with the advent of a digitally connected world that you could have the potential of big systemic effects with relatively little cost and little presence, especially be given the diversity of our system. So I don't think there's any um, real concern looking backwards. Not that there hasn't been intent, not that there hasn't been interest, not that there haven't been physical actions, whether that is bribes, payoffs, pamphlets, other sorts of things, but not any systemic uh, activity. I, I, I think that we can be confident in that regard because it would be so hard to affect physically and it is really hard to affect digitally. Sure, thank you. Uh, Dean Kelly, another question for you. Um, you, know, you mentioned the uh, North Carolina congressional race a couple of years ago uh, and the issues there. If on a, um, on a national scale, let's say that in six months, uh, evidence of fraud was uncovered or evidence of irregularity that would change the result, um, what on earth would happen then? You know, if the courts are faced with uh, an election that was in some way um, illegitimate, uh, what recourse is there to, to go back in time and, and change anything? Is there anything that courts could do? Well, I mean, what we did in North Carolina was that the, the, the election result that had been obtained illegally was actually, you know, it was actually allowed to be in effect until the election could be rerun. Uh, and so, um, so I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't foresee, but now we're in the world of pure speculation. I don't foresee us swearing somebody in and then four months later unswearing them in. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. That would, different processes, impeachment, other things would have to uh, be, be, be put into um, place. So I, don't, I don't really think impeachment would be the relevant process unless the, 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 the winner had a hand in it. Um, so, uh, so I think that's, that's, an, that's it's, it's, it's pretty far-fetched. Um, so, sure. you know, a year ago, there are a lot of things that are happening in our world right now that we thought were, would have been pretty far-fetched if somebody had mentioned them to us. So, so who knows? Uh, that so, is a true story. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, when, when you talk about foreign influence and like Sue Gordon was talking about too, you know, these days in advanced democracies, influence and fraud does not occur at the ballot box, right? It occurs in the minds of voters. It occurs in the pre-electoral period. And, uh, and, and, and that makes it very ambiguous and difficult to um, both, both identify and to also actually identify what the true effect of it is. And so when you say, what's there actually in fact, how do you, how do you really trace that? Um, it's difficult. Sure. 
And, uh, and Sue Gordon, I'd like to come back to this notion of, of foreign interference. Do you have, I mean, as you say, you know, the intelligence community spoke openly about it because it was considered a, a legitimate, realistic threat. But in 2020, mm -hmm. especially with the, the chaos that's being fermented here in the US, how seriously do you expect the threat of foreign interference to be taken in Washington, you know, and in the halls of power? Do you have any sense that, that it is being taken seriously? Oh, I think it is. I think one of the things for folks to, to remember is you see what's going on at the presidential and the top level, but, but there are women and men in jobs and agencies who are doing their job and, and they do that job undeterred. There is probably, there are probably few issues that are getting more attention right now than election security and ensuring no matter what effort we've put in to date that we continue to stay on top of it, we can continue to monitor the threats and carry this all the way through. So seriously, absolutely. And just remember that there is all the things that are happening at the very highest levels, but then there are below that, just regular old work to do the systems business to make sure that we are free and open and, and repeatable and all those things and all that work is going on. So you should feel completely confident that this work is getting the attention of the system and staying on top of it because it is, if it were allowed to occur, it would be so damaging and it is so insidious, a lot of focus and some of the best work I've seen recently going on. It's encouraging to hear. Um, and at the same time, you know, at the beginning, uh, you said about the, the need for individual people to be critical, uh, you know, observers of the things that we see. Uh, but we know that, you know, a lot of uh, uh, the propaganda that gets put out about the US election or for the US election from foreign agents is very sophisticated and uh, certainly is able to deceive a lot of voters when mm -hmm. it just provides extra partisan information that agrees with what they already think. Right. How, what can you suggest to, um, uh, for how people can be more critical or how on an individual level people can kind of weed out um, what is foreign propaganda from what's actually going on here in the US? Um, so I think, I think again, there are technical things that can be done in our social media um, companies to look at what is illegitimate, not good or bad, not having an opinion, but whether it is, uh, there's a pedigree to each of these accounts and it isn't bots and it isn't for many things. You know, truth, even when represented digitally has its own sound, you know, how does it spread? So I think there's a lot of work that has gone on and much more that needs to go on to work on the truth side so that what we get is more likely to be true. I, I would say on an individual side, there are two things, quit, <laughs> forwarding, amplifying messages that you don't understand where they came from, you know, just exposing. And when you watch the news, be, be really mindful of things that either don't make sense, do not comport with your experience, or are trying to tell you what to believe. Look into the event, do your own research, but just this notion. So now when I see um, a report of, let's see, what was, what was today? It was at New Jersey or no, in Minneapolis with this notion that they caught these people doing ballot harvesting or something. You know what my thought was? I have no idea whether that's true. It looks true. You know, it's reported as it is true. It matches a message that somebody wants you to believe, but, but I now almost do, don't believe things that don't necessarily comport with my experience of what was going on. And that isn't a very satisfying answer, but it would be lovely if we stopped being sheeple and started doing some critical thinking about the information that we're receiving. That would indeed be spectacular. Um, Dean Kelly, I'd like to come back to you. Um, so much of how elections and democracies work is down to norms rather than laws and policies. Um, and I think we're learning in 2020 how many norms we've taken for granted. And in the last four years, a lot of them have been just completely thrown out of the window. When it comes to election protection, you know, are there policies that the US lacks that it should have? Um, or can we have faith that our norms will be enough to carry them through and widespread acceptance of those norms? Are there any lessons we could learn from other countries? Um. I kind of feel like, um, you know, that person in the canoe headed towards the waterfall and you're saying so far so good, <laughs> you 
you know, because our norms have held and our rules have been adequate. And yet it feels like there might be a waterfall we're about to crash over very soon. Uh, and our, our norms will be put to a, uh, an enormous stress test. Um, now in terms of what we could learn from other uh, countries might actually be to give some credence and pay some attention to international election monitoring and the views of other countries of our election. Um, we have been encouraging other countries to do that for a long time. Um, we could go and, and read some of the concerns that the OSC has already expressed about our election and uh, that is coming up. Uh, they have a long list of, of concerns that are more, I would say some of them more big picture. They're not like worried that we won't be able to count our ballots, et cetera, et cetera. There are concerns about um, the 2013 changes to the Voting Rights Act and the fact that um, that that Congress has not established a new formula as, as the Supreme Court uh, said would need to be done in order for, um, uh, for, uh, for the Voting Rights Act Section 5 to be uh, implemented properly. Um, they have pointed out things about um, felon voting rights, you know, that are very, very different in the United States from a lot of other countries in the United States. Once you're a convicted felon, you know, even when you leave, um, prison and have served a sentence, uh, you are not able to vote. The OSC has spoken out against and, and, uh, the fact that um, that people are being made to pay, you know, the, the definition of a convicted felon now and having served your sentence apparently also is that you have to finish paying every single fine even after you're released. And if you haven't paid fine X, Y, Z, you know, and some people argue that that's essentially a mouse to a poll tax. So you can't vote until you've paid these fines. Et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think what we could learn from other countries is to um, at least pay attention to what international observers are saying when they come to our country and ask ourselves whether our standards uh, could be improved overall, uh, whether there are, are uh, measures that we could take in our elections that would improve the credibility of them. There are still people, obviously, who question the fact that we don't actually directly elect the president, but that we have, you know. Um, delegates who, who, who vote on our behalf is a kind of a bizarre system. Um, maybe we should be asking ourselves whether our system really is uh, suited for the modern world when it comes to some of those things. Indeed, and uh, a discussion of the Electoral College and delegate system could be a, a, another discussion of many years just by itself. Um, I'd like to move on here. We have another question in the chat. Um, you know, Sue Gordon mentioned earlier about how when we have the kind of division that we have right now, or the lack of trust in the system, that we're doing the work of foreign agents for them. Um, and a question we have here is that given, given that, what is the role and responsibility of higher education, as well as nonpartisan and non-political segments of our civic culture, in de-escalating this polarization and strength, strengthening, and strengthening our overarching connections as citizens? What should higher education be doing? That was a I think it was for you, Sue, right? Or was yeah, it um, I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Sorry. So actually one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to be um, a Rubenstein Fellow at Duke is because I think this is where thought starts. I think it is the best opportunity to present the broadest view of what is happening in context um, because it is foundational that way. So, so I'll let you to talk about from an institutional perspective on the individual, on the people coming through our systems. I think these are important conversations to have. I think it is important to talk about current events in historical context. I think it's important to talk about US activities in, in global context, to be able to see clearly um, the good and the challenges, especially now, because as I mentioned, I think this is one of those moments where the world has changed so dramatically that before COVID, we were kind of trying to pretend that we could do things the same way and muscle our way to achieving the same outcome. And I think what COVID showed is just how independent we, uh, interdependent we are 
um, just how much we're making decisions for each other. And so you have this almost open system again that somebody is going to have to come in and not necessarily organize a new, but imagine new ways to achieve, achieve the outcomes we've historically tried to do. And if that doesn't go through our higher education, then I don't know what our higher education is designed to do. I would add on to that and say, as much as we've been uh, voicing concern about XYZ, truly you should not be concerned because Duke is up to this challenge. <laughs> now, uh, we are doing three things here at Duke. One, we are educating the next generation and we're ed educating them to be critical thinkers. And we at Duke are doing that and universities around this country are doing that. And that's important too. We are creating knowledge. Um, and as a matter of fact, you will often find that some of the inquiries into the conduct of election and how things were done, et cetera, are done by academics. Academics uh, serve an important observation role and they are the ones that often are able to statistically pick up abnormalities. They've historically been in the forefront of conducting uh, inquiries of different kinds, but they also create knowledge around, you know, voter turnout and all sorts of different things. Three, um, we're also providing real hands-on solutions. You spoke earlier about how can, how can citizens know what's real and what isn't real and how can, they, um, how can they sort that out? Well, right here at the Stanford School of Public Policy, uh, we are um, leading you know, the, the fact-checking uh, development of automated fact-checking through our DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. We're working closely with Google, Facebook, and others in embedding code in their language that enables fact-checking organizations from around the world to fact-check. Um, that is all uh, work that's come out right here of the Sanford School of Public Policy. And if you want to follow up on that, you should be talking to Bill Adair, our professor, who has been doing all of this with students, mind you. Thank you very much. And yes, I would point out Bill Adair was uh, in our briefing uh, that we had a couple of months back on misinformation and disinformation. I would encourage you to check it out on YouTube. Uh, we're almost to time here. I would give one more shout out for questions. You can post them in the Q&A uh, if you like, and we can uh, get to those before we sign off. But um, uh, Sue Gordon just mentioned COVID. And Dean Kelly, I wanted to ask you about this. So obviously, we know that so far, the main impact on the election has been the increase in uh, requests for mail-in absentee ballots. Um, but on the day, uh, obviously, this is a global pandemic. Do you have any experience you know, in elections you've uh, observed and things you've studied overseas? of elections taking place in a pandemic and what kind of potential chaos or problems we might see on the day as large numbers of people are trying to vote and obviously doing so safely and in a distanced way? Well, I mean, we have seen, uh, we, we have seen issues uh, already. I mean, uh, Belarus held an election recently, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, uh, you know, we've held our primaries in the middle of pandemics and some of them have gone uh, better than others. I think that we are at a stage of the pandemic in the United States where we are much better uh, informed about how to set up safe polling stations. I think people uh, wearing masks and doing social distancing and following all the health protocols, we know how to implement a, 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 a safe voting experience. Uh, the concern is more with um, uh, getting enough people to sign up to work in those polling stations. And we don't want that to decrease the number of stations we can, we can, we can muster because that has an effect on how far people have to travel uh, to the polling stations. And we need to find ways to provide safe transportation to polling stations for people. Um, and so those are, those are some logistical challenges, but you know, if we could put a man on the moon, we can figure out how to get a voter to the, to the poll and, and do that. Um, so. Absolutely. Uh, and I can't really think of a better place to leave it than there. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, and thank you to our panelists, Judith Kelly and Sue Gordon, for sharing your perspectives. Duke's holding weekly briefings on the election, the pandemic, racial justice, and other issues. If you'd like to be on the list for future briefings, please email news at duke.edu to let us know. In the meantime, please stay well and be sure to vote. Thank you all so much and have a great day. And thank you to the members of the media for the important work you do in and uh, keeping our elections safe and, and upholding the integrity of them. You're here. Absolutely. Thank you everyone so much. Have a great day.